Our recording. You can show your screen and we can get started. Is the Los Angeles line or There we go. I can see that well. Right. Is Carlo here? Yes, sir. I'm here. Hi, how Carlo. Are how are you? Fine, sir. Good. I'd like to introduce uh, our students here today. We have David Wiles. David? Hi there. And uh, we have Hi. Hassan Tariq. Hi. Hi. So we're ready to go ahead and get started. We're giving you the uh, field, and we've got the recorder started. The understand that the doctor Jonathan Tobias is online or And I'm online, I'm talking. Can I help you? Are we ready with also with Los Angeles? I think I think we're all ready. All right. So what we're going to do today is to to start Is it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, we can start. The title, as you saw today, is uh, the role of uh, coronary spasm in uh, patients with coronary anomalies. And the inter introduction starts with a summary of uh, the issues at uh, discussion. Basically, we are talking about uh, explaining uh, mechanisms. Oh, this is it. This is my mechanism of coronary insufficiency in patients with coronary anomalies. Initially, the problem was explained with uh, an atrophy, and uh, this is uh, what you see here in the autopsy of a young girl that died of sudden cardiac death during exercise with the uh, left coronary artery coming from the right sinus of the salva close to the left uh, in the cross section in the histology uh, out just inside the wall of the artery just underneath uh, the uh, adventitia becoming very constricted and uh, justifying the impression that coronary anomalies can be caused of ischemia if uh, there is stenosis. And the stenosis should be seen uh, with uh, in vivo with something accurate uh, as uh, it is uh, uh, intravascular ultrasound that allows you to see not only in a fixed mode, but especially in vivo during the um, action of the heart, the changes in uh, cross-sectional uh, narrowing 
of the coronary arteries affected by anomalous origin. Here you see in systole and in diastole in a patient with the right coronary artery coming from the left having severe stenosis. This is the size of the probing uh, uh, device for intravascular ultrasound. It's the larger than the opening. Uh, the distance from here to there is about 1.1, 1.2 millimeters in diameter. So this is uh, the most severe type of uh, stenosis uh, that justifies the symptoms, especially with exercise. We have seen uh, uh, these conditions in uh, the case of the left coronary artery, allowing for many different uh, patterns of uh, anormalities. Intramural course is uh, the main for that mechanism of being uh, the artery within the wall of the aorta for a, a limited uh, distance from the ostium and being submitted to the pressure of the dilating ascending aorta. Uh, the most frequent uh, left coronary artery coming from the right sinus of Alsalva is the one that goes at the level of the sinotubular junction and it's uh, uh, obstructed at this level. But it can go also from the same uh, sinus uh, directly down in front of the anterior commissure, make it difficult to resolved by unroofing. Also from the non-coronary sinus, but we have seen two patients, uh, one in the literature, one in our own experience, in which a normal origin of the left coronary artery was coming directly down from a normal sinus uh, position into the wall of the sinus of Valsalva and becoming a picardian only at the end of the lower part of the left sinus of Alsalva. Now we're talking about uh, how patients with this kind of anomaly and not the one that we described until now, uh, left uh, a cows where the coronary artery comes from the right sinus of Alsalva, it goes intramurally and is uh, stenotic at this level. In this case, this uh, is called interceptor course the left coronary artery that comes from the right is uh, 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 running straight down at the level of the outflow tract of the right ventricle into the infundibulum to become maybe cardial only at the level of the interventricular um, uh, the interventricular sulcus, which is this where the LAD is, the diagonal, the obtuse margin of one and two. This is left side, this is right side, anterior and posterior in a cross section at the base of the heart. The problem for us has been for several years to understand if there was a mechanism for this kind of anomalies to have angina. Because some patients with this that is normally called a benign condition can also be accompanied by anomalies, by symptoms, possible symptoms related to the anomalous course. So let's see a series of four cases in which uh, we show the possible role of uh, uh, spasm to document symptoms or to call, uh, find a cause for symptoms in patients uh, that manifested with uh, angina typically at rest. The first case is a case uh, of a patient that started becoming symptomatic recently at the age of 46. He had normal, normal physical activities until uh, age 45 and basically started with angina at rest, especially at night so suggestive of Prince Metal Angina. The patient had to go to the emergency room in two occasions before I saw the patient in our center. He was living in San Diego, California, and he was sent 
with the last of these two episodes that he had, uh, he was sent to the Scripps Clinic to have a full emergency catheterization because of uh, ST elevation, uh, T changes, uh, evolutionary, and uh, mild uh, uh, elevation troponin. In the catheterization found in uh, the Scripps Clinic, they found what was described as left coronary artery from the right sinus of Asalvo with a course between aorta and pulmonary course or intramural uh, with mild hypoplasia and they studied this problem of possible cause of uh, ischemia by adenosine FFR, the functional reserve of blood flow that was uh, mildly uh, limited. 0.8 uh, is the um, discriminatory or the um, borderline value for significant stenosis usually goes with a 70% stenosis that reduces the um, flow, uh, maximum flow capacity. At that point, the patient was referred to Stanford in the pediatric uh, uh, department of Stanford. They have a rich uh, experience of uh, unroofing of uh, anomalous arteries with intramural course, and uh, they uh, agreed that there was uh, in between a aorta pulmonary course and scheduled the patient for surgery. At this point, the mother-in-law came to the picture, and she did, uh, evidently she is a fairly young mother-in-law that uses internet, and in Google she found out that we should have an opinion in Houston. So they sent in 24 hours, we had already a CD with the pictures, and uh, uh, we came up with the conclusion that this was an anomalous artery you know, on the left anterior descending from the right, but uh, with uh, an intraseptal course. And uh, we thought that in reviewing the movies that FFR was probably dec uh, decreased or limited because of uh, the guiding catheter that was used that was uh, positioned in an obstructive position at the ostium of the coronary artery that was fairly small. There could have been spasm. So that was uh, if, uh, an additional reason to uh, use uh, studies for seeing endothelial dysfunction as uh, a, a cause of spasm. We advised to continue with the uh, workup uh, to include a, a, an acetylcholine test to see if spasm could explain the symptoms that were very suggestive of, uh, of angina, spastic angina. In the past, uh, we studied similar cases with intraseptal course of the left coronary artery coming from the right. Do you think it, we are online? We never heard anything. And uh, in the past, uh, both us and the pathology uh, people uh, concluded that uh, this is a benign um, condition. And B. Roberts used this type of anomaly that uh, involves uh, the intramural course in the septum, so with systolic compression, that this is a benign anomaly. But still in the literature especially, but also in our experience, there are cases with resting angina, some cases with progressive cardiomyopathy, some cases with reversible cardiomyopathy, some cases with uh, uh, sudden cardiac death, they were not well documented. There are at least uh, one or two cases that are claimed to be related to an interceptor course. Several patients have been uh, reported with difficulties in surgery, in doing an unroofing or implanting or bypass surgery. Obviously, all of them implying that the diagnosis was not intramural course, but uh, intraseptal. And uh, 
this chapter obviously is in evolution and uh, this is what we found uh, to advance uh, the, the knowledge of possible alternative uh, uh, explanations of this pathology. In this patient we suspended all uh, vasodilators and uh, uh, beta blockers for 48 uh, hours. Uh, during this period the patient increased uh, the incident, the event of uh, unstable angina and required in two occasions to take sublingual nitroglycerin to resolve the, stud, the symptoms, so consistent with the presence of spasm. At the initial angiography we didn't find any changes of spasm, so we gave uh, nitroglycerin, I mean uh, acetylcholine, uh, the dosage of 100 micrograms intracoronary over two minutes. Chest pain occurred uh, with severe characters and uh, uh, no AV block by STT changes of mild nature and hypotension. Uh, angiography showed uh, the left circumflex coming from the normal sinus of Alsava, the left, but the left until descending alone coming from the right sinus of Alsava. We will show the acetylcholine test in a series of pictures. After uh, provoking the symptoms and showing with angiography the changes, we gain nitroglycerin that resolved both hypotension, ST changes, and chest pain. So everything consistent with the fact that this could have been the mechanism of the symptoms. This is an injection in the left uh, sinus of Alsava where only the circumflex uh, is uh, originating. This is the initial injection in the left coronary artery. The uh, left is, uh, I mean the left until descending in this case. The left until descending comes next to the right and uh, goes inside the crystal supraventricularis in the right ventricle, and then it becomes intramyocardial, has systolic compression of mild degree at this level, to become epicardial only at the level of the uh, origin of the diagonal. This is what happened in this case when uh, acetylcholine was given. As you see, there is diffuse narrowing of severe degree. This is rarely seen in the traditional uh, Prince Meta cases that we have seen over several years and studied with uh, ergonovin initially and acetylcholine now, usually spasm is localized. In this case it's diffuse, it's all over the system of the left until descending with an ectopic orange. With nitroglycerin everything returns to normal, blood pressure, EKG changes, chest pain, and the size of the artery is returned to normal. So the patient was discharged on nifedipine and nitro patches that eventually was changed to long-acting nitrates and L-arginine, uh, one gram, uh, four times a day to restore um, nitrate, nitrates in the, in the wall of the, um, in the endothelium. In the follow-up, uh, for three months we followed this patient and we heard recently that he is now back to pretty normal activities with our shortness of breath and without uh, any uh, chest pain event, neither at rest nor at night nor with exercise. This is the first case, uh, most likely uh, endothelial dysfunction related spasm of the LAD with an ectopic orange. This is another case, a 68-year-old Latin American female with the unstable angina, comes from Mexico, has a single right uh, uh, sinus of Alsalva, large ostium, you will see at this level, that gives origin both uh, to the normal right coronary artery, which is very large, the circumflex, uh, that is this one up there, this is the cranial right anterior oblique, and the left anterior descending, which is this vessel here. 
is a cranial right anterior oblique projection. At this point, the ejection fraction is 30%. The patient has, for some months, a known leventicular myopathy in the presence of this anomaly, and she was referred to our center to consider surgery for an anomalous origin. They had doubt if this was or not intramural in the wall of the left main uh, of the aortic root. This is what happened in these patients with the same dosage of 100 micrograms of acetylcholine, severe, severe diffuse spasm of both the LAD, which is this vessel, minor but also of the circumflex, and especially in the circumflex. Nitroglycerin was given quickly and resolved the symptoms, and both the right and the LAD and also the circumflex recover normal size. Again, uh, we use patches of nitroglycerin initially and then uh, uh, long-acting nitrates and procardia, and the patient improved uh, eventually because the blood pressure was too low on uh, procardia. She was tried on Norvege, but this didn't work uh, that well. We added uh, uh, L-arginine, uh, but because of symptoms, uh, because evidence of edema of the lower extremities, uh, uh, Norvash was substituted in Mexico for Ranexa, and empirically Ranexa improved a little bit the, the, the chest pain initially, but eventually uh, she continues to be symptomatic, both because of atypical angina and my shortness of breath. The ejection fraction in the last three years of follow-up has improved a little bit to 40%, which is promising, at least it denies the presence of progressive nature of cardiomyopathy, but surely it's not normal yet. So a case where nitroglycerin, where anti-spastic evidence uh, of improvement uh, could be consistent with the role of uh, spasm in this patient with cardiomyopathy. Another patient, even more dramatic, it's a patient that is closer to our experience because he's in the cardiologist, a patient that during his uh, residence and fellowship in uh, cardiology in North Carolina, started having typical angina, and eventually I saw him at age uh, 26, uh, but he started at age 24 with uh, uh, recurrent admissions in the emergency room because of typical chest pain tendentially at rest. Uh, he had also sometimes chest pain with exercise, but typically the pain would come both uh, at night or during the day, especially with emotions and would respond to nitroglycerin. In some occasions, especially more recently, it had also troponin elevation, but rarely. The ejection fraction was still normal, and uh, the diagnosis on coronary angiography from uh, the early age of 26 showed left coronary artery coming from the right sinus of our salva with the pre-pulmonic course in front of the right ventricular outflow tract. And uh, at that time, medicines uh, like uh, before, nitrates, uh, calcium antagonists, uh, and arginine were given and had a discrete uh, uh, improvement symptomatically, but it continued with some uh, spells. And as uh, we mentioned here, it was in the emergency room some 100 times over the last uh, 16 years uh, since presentation. This is uh, the initial movie uh, cineangiograms of a single ostium of the right sinus of Asalva with a big, large uh, right coronary artery, a big, large uh, left uh, main trunk uh, going ep uh, epicardially in front of the right ventricular outflow tract that would be here. The left anterior descending uh, starts at this point uh, and is fairly small distally 
uh, it has a, a nourishment 50% from the right posterior descending and 50% from the left main. That is fairly small at this period, at this level. It has a, an unusual homocollateral, a collateral around this uh, site that there was, is the site of the major spasm. So you understand this anatomy. The left uh, from the right sinus of a salva with a common uh, ostium and a common trunk and everything combining in the uh, intracoronary nitroglycerin uh, initial uh, image. This is after nitro uh, acetylcholine testing. Uh, this was uh, done also with IVUS that caused severe pain. But even without IVUS, severe spasm at this level and severe spasm at this level of the LAD. If you want to see this, uh, this is an intravascular ultrasound at the level of the proximal uh, left main, and this at the level of the uh, um, pulmonic LAD, I mean distal LAD where there was a, a significant stenosis. The diameter was 4.6 at the proximal level and 1.8 at this level with the acetylcholine 1.4. Basically, there was a total occlusion of the left main with the acetylcholine. So the patient continued with the periods of more or less stable angina over the years always objected to the idea of being so aggressive as to consider surgery, he hated the idea to have the sternum cracked as he saw several patients with that experience and didn't like it at all. He was a non-invasive, he is a non-invasive cardiologist. At this point though, especially because he, he had two kids and he was anxious to start playing with them and to get involved in some sports, he was totally disabled and decided to come back for reconsideration of the possibility of doing something more aggressive, hopefully with uh, stents, but uh, if not with surgery. So he came in uh, September this year and uh, we did uh, see another angiogram that was done recently in Arkansas where he was coming from. Uh, uh, that showed the spastic left main and uh, hypoplastic bridge of, uh, of the proximal left main. When he came here, we did another Sestamibi stress test. They had chest pain, but no uh, ischemia in the uh, stress test. And we decided to consider surgery in view of the severe uh, symptoms of uh, recurrent angina and disabling uh, symptoms. Uh, at that point, uh, initially, he decided to reconsider the options after hearing the surgeon to explain what would be possible doing. Uh, basically, the surgeon uh, suggested to do a vein graft uh, um, uh, to the proximal territory in the largest uh, segment, uh, which was uh, the distal uh, circumflex or proximal LAD past the insertion of the left main into the left anterior system, uh, left anterior descending. He heard that story, he didn't like uh, extent, uh, so he went home another time thinking about surgery but not uh, having the, the, the commitment to the project yet. He made it uh, to, um, to uh, uh, Dallas and eventually was admitted to the emergency room with severe engine again, hypotension, ST changes, mild uh, troponin elevation, and he decided to come back and have uh, the bypass. A single bypass of the left anterior descending was done, but uh, a day, on day two, a day after surgery, the patient had been off uh, nitroglycerin patches, 
had uh, severe chest pain uh, that they recognized immediately as typical of his angina, and the ST changes with prolongation of the ST, the, the QT uh, C was 630 milliseconds, very uh, ominous for the probability of degenerating a ventricular uh, tachycardia, and uh, uh, suggestive of ischemia without being totally typical. The fact is that the patient himself, a good cardiologist, uh, said why don't we exclude the possibility of uh, uh, occlusion of the vein graft, uh, as he was quite aware of the existence of uh, competitive flow and the possibility that this bypass could obliterate. Uh, so this was uh, the finding during uh, an angiogram that showed that the bypass the left anterior descending, I mean uh, the vein graft to the proximal left anterior descending was perfectly functional and the proximal left main had diffuse spasm at rest uh, that with nitroglycerin improved a little bit, but essentially most of the flow was coming from the vein graft and the distal left anterior descending was much better than before surgery but uh, obviously still there was a possibility of spasm at the level of the proximal left main. Basically is a good uh, follow-up uh, because we proved that the bypass is open and the bypass essentially protects uh, from ominous uh, uh, spasm even though there is still spasm at this level. As you see, there is spasm even of this collateral that with nitroglycerin opens up. These are very unusual collateral, homocollateral in the left main. So it was a follow-up, and in a week he was out of the hospital with nitrates and procardia still for three months, we said, and he's now in the middle of an advanced rehabilitation program where he has no more angina, uh, he has re recovered a much better physical capacity. He sends us uh, best wishes. Uh, he participated to a couple of meetings of our group uh, on the webinar, so he is quite sympathetic to the cause. The final case is uh, a variation in the symphony. Is uh, the fourth case, a 46-year-old white male, an old football player in the college in his college years then a military man in the Navy, and finally an industrial electrician. They started recently to have uh, uh, angina addressed, chest pain and shortness of breath, especially with heavy exertion in heat. And the last time he was admitted to the emergency room with a spell of hypotension and T changes, uh, uh, but no uh, troponin elevation. The workup included a CAT scan and geography that showed anomalous origin of the left coronary artery from the single ostium in the right sinus of Alsalva. They called this vessel intramural course between aorta and pulmonary artery, and it was already sent to a surgical center for unroofing that is totally wrong. This is not uh, a case of uh, intramural course, but retroaortic course. And uh, this is the result of the acetylcholine at 50 micrograms. It caused the almost complete obliteration of uh, the circumflex uh, and uh, left anterior descending. The left anterior descending in this case is essentially uh, part of the right coronary artery posterior descending. The, all the septals, we don't have here the complete study, but all the septal come from the posterior descending that reaches the epicardial portion. And uh, with the acetylcholine testing, also the, circum, also the left anterior descending territory, the septals uh, is with the circumflex go into a severe spasm. Again, AV block, uh, uh, ST elevation, chest pain, everything uh, resolved with nitroglycerin. 
So we have now this panorama that is obviously just initial. We started with this routine study of patients with angina suspicious of, uh, of uh, Prince Metal angina, especially angina at rest, in patients with anomalous coronary arteries, especially the left from the right. And we can conclude at this point uh, in this preliminary experience. This is totally new. Nobody ever reported anything of this kind. But we saw now cases with pre-pulmonic uh, course of the left from the right. Uh, they can cause Prince Metal Angina, like in the patient with the cardiologist with the Prince Metal Angina in surgery. It could be intraceptal uh, that we have seen in two cases today with Prince Metal Angina and positive acetylcholine tests. The intramural aortic course, uh, the typical uh, cause of uh, fixed stenosis uh, because of the intramural passage uh, inside the wall of the aorta, does not cause this uh, spastic angina, even though patients with the, uh, this type of pathology can have resting pain. And in the future, I plan to do some cases with acetylcholine uh, testing. The retroaortic uh, uh, course uh, was never associated in my experience until this last case that we just presented with the uh, uh, spastic angina and positive acetylcholine test. The retrocardiac uh, origin of the left from the right never was associated with spastic angina or studied with acetylcholine test. The case that we just saw of uh, a, a retroaortic uh, uh, circumflex had the wraparound uh, origin of the left anterior descending from the posterior descending, and that case had the positive uh, history of angina, and now we know related to spasm, both of the circumflex and the LAD. So this is what we present to your discussion. That this uh, could be a significant anomaly of the function, not only of the anatomy of these patients, where narrowing is not fixed but intermittent and related possibly to spasm that we can reproduce with a acetylcholine test of endothelial dysfunction. And I'd love to hear your comments and uh, experience. In particular, in, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, the implications of these initial cases, we should conclude that, yes, uh, uh, spasm should be considered and acetylcholine could be uh, indicated eventually more strongly than at this early stage. But it should be clear that we're dealing with causing spasm with acetylcholine in cases of uh, confirmed spasm uh, of the left main. So you need to be uh, very careful and very alert. You need to be ready to take care of spasm and you need to give uh, immediate nitroglycerin if you want to do these studies safely. Uh, nitroglycerin should be given after pulling uh, acetylcholine and not uh, following acetylcholine in the, in the catheter because the catheter contains about 25 micrograms of, uh, of acetylcholine. So it will increase the effect if you don't uh, flush with saline before, uh, I mean, after pulling the, the content of the guiding catheter. Eventually, nitroglycerin will eliminate and it never cause ventricular fibrillation or serious irreversible problem, but it is a, a very tricky uh, procedure when the left main is involved in spasm. This is quite exceptional in the typical uh, Prince Metal Angina, and this testing should be done with great uh, prudence and uh, alertness. Uh, nitroglycerin should be on standby and uh, uh, used immediately. All right, this is 
for your further consideration. I want to go back to the orange. Uh, <coughs> Paolo, can you hear me now? Very well. Thank you, John. Oh, oh good, because I was listening to everything, but I was muted the whole time, so I couldn't ask I'm any so, questions. I'm so sorry, but we here. can go back. I'm sorry, too. I unmuted you. I, I found that out and unmuted you, Jonathan. Yeah. I asked, I, I asked all the time if you were there, and I was sure that you were there, but it was not totally right, sure. Right. So I, I heard the whole thing. I've, I've been here the whole time. So uh, this is really fascinating cases, but so wh what percentage of your patients do you try the acetylcholine test on? Uh, is it just these patients who had rest angina and therefore you were suspicious of a spasm, or have you given it to all patients who have uh, anomalous coronary arteries? Excellent question. And it is correct that I didn't use this, but in patients with very suspicious suggestive history of resting angina, spastic angina on a clinical basis. So basically the indication of using acetylcholine is the same as any other patient. But in these patients I knew already the, the anatomy involved uh, an anomalous origin. And after this early experience, this is all of my experience, four cases, uh, is uh, only uh, limited to the last six months of uh, studies is probably is probably 50 cases 50 percent of the cases of left main with anomalous origin that I've seen in this last six months. So the question though is <clears throat> what is causing this? The spasm. Presumably there's some endothelial dysfunction because that's why people respond with spasm to acetylcholine instead of vasodilation. So is it something to do with, I mean it would seem to make sense since uh, this is unusual uh, to have spasm of this degree and to have it associated in four cases with anomalous coronaries that there's something about the anomalous coronary which also implies some uh, predisposition to endothelial dysfunction. Yeah, you're so, right. It would, be, it would be fascinating to know what, what percentage of uh, patients with anomalous coronaries uh, have uh, spasm. We will find out for sure in patients with symptoms. With the patients without symptoms, I don't expect it, but it could be. That is a, uh, an active... Uh, uh, mechanism. I talked about this uh, uh, association with uh, embryologist and anatomy, and uh, for the study, the development of the coronary arteries, I know that uh, there are associations between the coronary artery development and the development of the nerves of the heart. The nerves of the heart mm -hmm. are affected by or the contributed uh, by the neural crest, uh, cells that come from the spinal cord and they go to the root of the common truncus at the time of development of the coronary arteries and invade the myopagia, the ventricle uh, part of the heart, following the coronary artery distribution. Uh, so it could be uh, that this is uh, the source of the connection, the, the association between spasm or dysfunction of the probably the nerve uh, uh, control of the, uh, the media of the vessels. The fact that is most of these uh, coronary arteries are inside the muscle where nerves don't go. That's interesting. The nerves remain at the cardio. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, in the retroiotic course, uh, the coronary artery is inside the fibrous body of the heart. Uh, but uh, I don't know yet. Uh, it's interesting that you, you ask for that question because this will be discussed uh, in uh, the meeting of biologists, uh, embryologists, and anatomists in San Diego. In San Diego, there's going to be a meeting at the early 
part of uh, April, and this will be one of the subjects of discussion. And Paolo, have you given have you given acetylcholine to people who have myocardial bridges without anomalous coronary yes. arteries? Yes, very much so. And uh, and following in this the uh, initial experience of especially Japanese and uh, South Korean uh, uh, cardiologists that have a rich experience and in their uh, media in, the, in the, those countries, as you know, spasm is more frequent than it is ever, much likely. And that done uh, a large series in the range of 1,000 cases in a single uh, institution, whereby they would use a acetylcholine test in every patient uh, with uh, normal coronary artery, absence of coronary disease when the patients have evidence of ischemia or suggested history of ischemia. And they found that 50% of the people with myocardial bridge had spasm at the level of the myocardial bridge when you give acetylcholine. So it's an it's important uh, uh, additional information. The intermyocardial course uh, at the level of myocardial bridge may have the same issues of lack of adequate uh, uh, innervation as in our cases uh, with the uh, strange coronary courses. But in, in your cases, some of the artery is intramyocardial and other aspects of it are epicardial, but the epicardial arteries also had spasm. Is that correct? You're right. And uh, the spasm is beyond uh, the intermyocardial course. It's interesting that you mentioned this again because the case with the triple money course had a myocardial bridge at the level of the outflow tract of the right ventricle, just below the pulmonary valve. We documented this both with CAT scanning and surgery. We have pictures at surgery of a very thin myocardial bridge, but there is a myocardial bridge at the level of the outflow tract that we asked the surgeon to cut off. And he said, well, we're going to put the bypass. Don't worry about the myocardial bridge is benign. And it was thin, but it was interesting. I don't know if we're going to change anything, but uh, it is uh, an interesting uh, comment on where the, the, the myocardial bridges are and where the, the, the spasm occurs. The spasm in these patients is always diffuse. It's not localized like in patients of isolated myocardial bridges. Has anyone seen spasm in a myocardial bridge? On, uh, excuse me, has anybody seen atherosclerosis in a myocardial bridge? Have you ever seen any of that ever? I did, uh, and I will uh, mention that this is both by coronary angiography, but especially with the intravascular ultrasound. Narrowing a fixed degree, not uh, systolic only uh, of the myocardial bridge coronary artery are related usually to organized clots. But I was uh, uh, shows it very well, and I've seen at least three patients with uh, an LAD myocardial infarction that after resolution of the clot in the first uh, uh, stage uh, with thrombolytics one uh, with this. Uh, uh, what do you call it, thrombectomy in the other, they showed uh, systolic compression like myocardial bridge at the level of the total occlusion. So in those cases, uh, we published those cases, the uh, myocardial bridge was at the level of the clot. So that is the kind of uh, stenosis, fixed stenosis that you can see at myocardial bridge. After the sclerosis, is extremely rare, and I'm not very sure. No. 
This heart here is the uh, right coronary coming, having the uh, main left coming off the right. That's like the Pete Maravich heart, correct? Uh, I don't remember. He was a single coronary artery. I don't remember the course. I don't think it's uh, published. Uh, yeah, I think, like yeah, that, that was published, and I've got a heart just like that uh, on the wall here that we show. And uh, apparently there was scar tissue at the distal LAD, out distally, uh, there was scar tissue where you would think that there would probably be the least uh, pressure out that far. And that's where the scar tissue was found that they think caused him to fibrillate. But did they mention the, the course of the coronary artery that was anomalous? Uh, they show the picture. It looks like this. Uh, and All right. It, and it looks it very much it. like this uh, in the anatomy. All right. Interesting. Talking about congenital coronary anomalies. And associated with sudden death. These patients uh, have triple collateral, evidently because of the recurrent spells of, uh, of basil. There was a homocollateral in the left main, a collateral to the distal uh, posterior descending was coming up and uh, providing 50% of the LAD flow, and the proximal posterior descending had the bypasses or uh, bypasses septals. They would reach the left anterior descending during spasm. But we had the over complete occlusion of the left main. The spasm would, uh, as I mean, the collateral flow would come from the first two posterior descending were very large, very unusual. So evidently, in several occasions, this patient was able to occlude completely and eventually uh, elaborate, uh, create a collateral flow, which is quite amazing. Are we still live? Uh, yes, Paolo. Paolo, have you seen, in atherosclerosis, have you seen much main left spasm during cardi cardiac catheterization in patients who have main left disease? Spasm is very rare and very mild and in general related to the touching, to the pressure of the guiding catheter or the regular catheter or the wire. But spontaneous spasm is very rare especially where there is no significant obstruction. But if you have 99% stenosis of the left main, usually it's different, the mechanism that produces total occlusion in those cases. You remember when we were using ionic uh, compress, frequently, if you do, if you did at that time, ionic compress and geology in three, four, five uh, projections with a lot of compress, you would be able to show uh, even shock from progression of the uh, left main disease to total occlusion. But that was thought, at least, to be related to osmotic uh, edema of the critical stenosis from the ionic contrast. Spasm, spontaneous spasm of the left main uh, without this kind of anomalies is quite unusual. With atherosclerosis, sub Total, yes, you can see it. Uh, years ago, when I was doing a lot of casts, we saw that, uh, of course, osteo main left was the big problem in the cath lab, and we decided that we would put nitroglycerin in the catheter, and when we did right. the first injection, we would inject nitroglycerin because we had a certain percentage of people that would go into electromechanical dissociation when you engage the main yeah. left, and inject there. And so uh, this was before nitroglycerin was available commercially. So we would take the tablets and dissolve them in liquid and sterilize it and put in the refrigerator. <laughs> and we started this protocol for severe main left disease and uh, decided for osteo or tubular main left, we would inject that in the contrast during the first injection. And we did that for uh, a while, and we compared that with our numbers prior to doing that, and we found that we weren't having uh, the deaths that people would have with uh, electromechanical dissociation that were involved with engaging the osteum of the main left. And so at that time, we were theorizing 
that perhaps there was some spasm. And we did look at some of the cross-sections of the people that did die uh, before that time, and we found that they did have some considerable muscle still intact in the main left. And uh, But then after a while, I really wondered if it wasn't really the nitroglycerin that was really causing uh, the effects because the uh, nitroglycerin came out of the refrigerator. We mixed with a contrast, and perhaps it was hypothermia that was responsible <laughs> for not having sudden death anymore in the cath lab with left main Eric, engagement. Eric, uh, my theory actually is that the change uh, from ionic to non-ionic contrast made the big difference. Now we don't see any more catastrophe after angiography from left main critical disease. Uh, I think it's also your experience, or John's experience, that uh, non-ionic uh, contrast is much more forgetful. Uh, it doesn't cause uh, a spasm. John, are you still there? He went to the cat lab. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I was going to make another comment about something we've been looking at lately, uh, Apollo, is uh, on some echoes we can't see the origin of the coronaries in adults, and on some MRIs, unless you have uh, a navigator for breath uh, timing, you also have trouble seeing the main left. And so we decided what we're going to do about that, and we said, well, we ought to be able to see it with coronary CT, and let's do a CT with one rotation of the gantry just to look at the origin of the arteries and not do anything else. And we got that down to 0.7 millisieverts. And so we're able to look at the coronary origins with a CT scan without much radiation exposure now with one gantry rotation. That's very good. If you have enough uh, definition, is great. Yeah. yeah, I have to show you some of those pictures sometimes. Very interesting. Uh, very good. Well, thank you very much. It's a, a great uh, conference and a great meeting. My students as well as Jonathan, we all appreciate what you do for us. And we've saved very these wide. because they're invaluable. And so I'm looking forward to April. We'll see if we can get a bigger group together uh, in December or January, okay? Very good. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank, Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye, Derek. Bye bye. Bye, Irby. All right. Evidently, they don't like.